Now, you know, in our worship, in the listening to God's Word. And we continue with our sermon series on Nehemiah. Uh, and today we have the title of A Servant's Guidance. Our text is from Nehemiah chapter 2. Um, I'm going to leave you to read the whole of chapter 2 on your own at home. But today we will be reading only verses 1 to 12. So hear now the word of the Lord, Nehemiah chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And the letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had, give, had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you want to do when you grow up? Looking at the crowd here, I think this question might, might feel like a very old question, but bear with me. What do you want to do when you grow up? Well, this was a question that a teacher asked us to write an essay on when I entered Sec 1. And actually... Uh, I really wanted to be a wandering Kung Fu master. Not a Shaolin monk, but more like a Yang Kuo in Se Diao Ying Song Chuan, right? But, uh, yeah, yeah. So Kung Fu master. Or, or some superhero, uh, really like um, with Superman powers, but with Batman costume. Because the Superman costume, a little bit... Mm. But I was more realistic than that. And so I recall writing that I wanted to be a technician. I had always enjoyed watching people figuring out how things work, fixing things, and then using the very cool tools. So until today, one of the favourite shops that I like to go to are those DIY shops, just to see what they have. Now, going to junior college, I had to decide my subject combination. And then after junior college, I had to decide which tertiary course to do. And then as I approached graduation, I began to see myself now really and even more seriously thinking about what to do as a responsible adult. What should I do after graduation? Now, if we live long enough, and we will, then we will know that as significant a decision as that might have been, it is not going to be the last significant decision to be faced in life. There will be more such significant decisions to come. Do I remain single? Do I marry this person? What house do I get? Do I stay on in my job, or do I move on to another job, or do I pursue further studies? Do I say yes to the person who asked me to serve in this ministry? Do I have kids? What school do I send my kids to? Do I change church? Do I accept this job offer overseas? Do I say yes to being asked to lead a ministry? Do I divorce my spouse who I find has changed so much? Do I stay on in my job or industry or should I move on to another one? Do I continue with this course of treatment for my illness? When do I retire? What do I do when I retire? Do I agree to serve in another ministry? 
Do I spend my last days in a nursing home, a hospice, or at home? Now, each of these decisions in life call for a decision. How will you decide? What will you do? What will guide your decision? Studying the book of Nehemiah, we see a man who was guided by what God had put into his heart to do. And that was to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And every decision that Nehemiah made was going to be guided by that one thing, what God had put into his heart to do. And a question that I hope will stay on and linger on in our minds today is, what has God put into your heart to do? Well, every first Sunday of the month, we pray the Lord's Prayer. And if we are sincere in praying that prayer, then what is God putting into our hearts to do? In the prayer, we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if Jesus taught all who would follow him to pray like this, then surely, surely God wants to put into our hearts to see the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus would again teach and command all who follow him, seek first, seek above all things, the kingdom of God. And why would God want to put that into all our hearts? It is because the figurative walls of his kingdom have been broken down by our human sin. And a part of what it means for God to save us from our sins is for him to restore his kingdom of righteousness, peace and joy. To rebuild and restore the kingdom of God, that is what Jesus, the Son of God, came to pronounce and to accomplish. With his death, he paid the price that was needed for all the brokenness of the world to be fixed. And with his resurrection, he guaranteed that in the end, all the brokenness will be fixed. And the broken kingdom of God on earth will be made new. It will be made new as an eternal dwelling of righteousness, peace and joy for all who would believe in him. The broken walls of God's kingdom must be rebuilt. But we may ask, now, what are these broken walls? Well, they are seen in various things. And here are some examples. The broken walls of God's kingdom can be seen in broken relationships, where there was originally peace among all. There are now tensions between parent and child, rivalry between siblings, irreconcilable differences or infidelity in a marriage, a broken trust between friends. It is also seen in broken justice, where there was originally recognition of the true justice and righteousness of God. Now, wrongs done against you are not made right, and wrongs are now condoned and even advocated for as human rights. It is also seen in broken lands, where the land originally was fruitful for human flourishing. Now, as in the case for, uh, during Nehemiah's time, the very land you call home on earth is devastated by civil war or invasion by a foreign power. Singapore has our own history of brokenness from war. And right now, millions are facing their own. The broken walls of God's kingdom can also be seen in a broken environment, where the world that God created and pronounced as good and even very good originally is now badly suffering the effects of man-made climate change. And adding to all these, for Christians, broken walls is also seen in a broken church. Like the universal church suffering the scandals of sexual abuse by its pastors, or the church tearing itself apart by moral theological controversies, or a church that is burnt out under the strain of internal disagreements, disputes and hurts, or a church that has become lukewarm and compromising in its faith, its love, its worship and obedience and service to God. For one or more of these reasons, the church in the western part of the world now has numerous magnificent church buildings, now either seeing less than 50 in a sanctuary that was once filled with hundreds of worshippers, or they are now operating as museums or bars instead of being a house of prayer. Friends, it is in this broken world that we must make all of our lives' decisions in. 
And there are essentially three broad directions that will guide all our decisions. Like it or not, any decision we make, ultimately, it will fall under one of these three directions. And that is to leave the broken world as it is, or break it down some more, or rebuild it to what it was meant to be. So then, since God wills to rebuild and restore His kingdom, the question we need to ask is, which of these directions will guide our decisions for life? The scriptures of Nehemiah urge us to be guided by the third, to choose the path of life that leads to the rebuilding and the restoration of God's kingdom. And brothers and sisters, to that end, God had put into Nehemiah's heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We come back to that question, what has God put into your heart to do? In the name of God's kingdom, is it to contribute towards the goal that everyone will be given their daily bread, that poverty is eradicated and no one is in lack? Is it to forgive offenders and to work for reconciliation and restoration with opportunities to turn over a new leaf, just as God has forgiven you? Or is it to help those who are experiencing trials in life that they may have hope? Or is it to stand up for the voiceless and marginalised and work justice for them and rescue them from evil? Or is it to heal and comfort the sick? Is it to find solutions and speak up so that the generations after us will have a livable environment to live in? Is it to strengthen families? Is it to pass on to the next generation all the wonderful works of God and help them to know, trust, love and follow Him? What is it? What has God put into your heart to do? Now when you find the answer to that question, then you will have God's guidance for all of the decisions you will ever have to face in life on this earth. And so as I prepared for this sermon, I am praying that this question will ring in our hearts and minds and that this question will disturb us even until we are able to answer it. What has God put into your heart to do in this broken world? And as we begin or continue to seek to answer this question, there are a few things that we must learn from Nehemiah about seeking and receiving God's guidance. And we will be going through seven points. Firstly, in seeking and receiving God's guidance, we need to note that God guides people, different people in different ways. So for example, the Bible describes God guiding Abraham and Moses through an audible voice. Anyone heard the voice of God before? No, okay. I, I know of some people who have, they tell me it sounds like Pastor Michael. <laughs> a deep voice. But others say it's a still small voice. Well, whatever it is, for Abraham and Moses, it was an audible voice. But God guided Isaiah and Ezekiel through visions. And then here for Nehemiah, we see that it was through situations. He heard a report of the state of Jerusalem and that stirred a burden and conviction in him to do something. And he recognized that stirring to be God's action of putting something into his heart to do. And so, don't miss receiving the guidance of God because you are so caught up trying to hear the voice of God or see visions from God. Often the very situations that you come to know about and disturbs you in such measure that you cannot ignore, they could well be God putting something in your heart to do something about. But how can you discern if that is truly guidance from God and not your own human idea or selfish ambition? And then that brings us to the next point. Discerning God's guidance requires us to first know God. Nehemiah knew God. He knew God's character. He knew God's covenant with his people. He knew God's promises. He knew God's word. We see all this in chapter 1. And all this knowledge combined with the report of the state of Jerusalem came together at the right time in which God put into his heart what he must do. Then we ask, then how can we first know God? Well, God has given us two things to help us to know him. His word, which is the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. And so simply to know God, read the Word, trust the Holy Spirit. 
Read or listen to the whole Bible. Not just listen to sermons or read books about the Bible, but read the Bible itself. Read it simply. Don't try to understand everything at one go. The things that you don't understand, don't worry about them. Because as you read other parts of Scripture, chances are they will shed light on this part that you don't understand. Read, and then read it again, and then again, and again, and again. And read it asking this question, what does this Scripture tell me about God? Even as we come to the Scriptures to learn and to know God, we want to ask this question, what does this passage tell me about God? And then we trust the Holy Spirit because Jesus had promised that He will send the Holy Spirit to all believers and this Spirit will guide us into all truth. And the Spirit will do it because more than you wish to know God, God desires to be known by you. And so if you are sincerely seeking God, the Holy Spirit will surely help you. That's how we can know God. Well, the next thing we can learn from Nehemiah is that seeking God's guidance is not a once-for-all thing. We need to seek God's guidance daily. Why? Because we are forgetful creatures. We can forget God's guidance and we need His reminding. And also because while God may put a long-term goal in our hearts, often God does not give us all the details at one go. He reveals it to us one step at a time. Someone once reflected that if God had told us everything we needed to do to accomplish what He wants us to do, we would have been scared off even before we began. God reveals His guidance in step one, step at a time. Nehemiah received his guidance from God the day he received the conviction to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But on the day he met with the king and he was questioned, he again prayed to God. No doubt he was praying for favour, but I believe he was also praying for guidance as to how to say what he needed to say to the king. Now having the clear, bigger goal enables us to discern whether smaller daily steps are from God or not, but we must also seek God's guidance daily for what He will have us to do each day towards that goal. Next point is that God's guidance may not be directly actionable immediately. And so we need to be patient. God guides through timing and opportunity also. We are told that it was in the month of Kislev that Nehemiah heard about the state of Jerusalem and he began to fast and pray before God. And it will only be three to four months later in the month of Nisan that the opportunity came for him to directly act on what God had put into his heart to do. You know, sometimes we expect God to answer us in the flesh and for things to play out according to God's plan in the flesh because as we read scriptures, well, it takes us maybe about 10 minutes to read from chapter 1 to chapter 2 of Nehemiah. But in that 10 minutes, we are actually reading 3 to 4 months. It may take us maybe an hour to read parts of Genesis where Abraham was called and he would be told that he would be made a great nation. But it would be many years later before he had his son. A few pages that we flip in the Bible represents perhaps decades, even centuries, before God's will is fulfilled. For Jesus on earth, the wait between his birth and when it was finally time for him to act was 30 over years. Friends, often God's guidance takes years to unfold and become directly actionable. Then what should we do while waiting for God's guidance, be it weeks, months or years? Well, we are not told what Nehemiah did other than prayer and fasting in those months of waiting. But for him to be able to tell the king so readily what he wished to do, the period of time needed, the logistics needed, it is reasonable to infer that Nehemiah had used those months wisely in gathering whatever else information he could and planning as best as he could for the mission that God had given to him. Also, for the king to be so favourable towards him, it is also reasonable to infer that while he was praying, fasting and planning, he did not slack in his duties as a cupbearer. He continued to fulfil his present duties as a cupbearer to the king excellently. 
And so while we wait for God's guidance in time, we do what we can with what we already know. We can pray, we can plan, we can learn or sharpen the skills and knowledge we anticipate we need when the time comes. We can keep growing in Christian maturity and being perfected in love. We can do our present jobs excellently so that when the time comes, we can leave our jobs without shame or hesitancy. We can begin adjusting and becoming accustomed to a new lifestyle of frugality that the task may require of us. Now, all these things may seem small in relation to what God has put into our hearts to do. But with God, it is only those who are faithful with little that He will entrust with more. While waiting for the guidance of the future, be faithful in the present, be faithful in the small. In Raymond Brown's commentary, which our sermon titles are based on, he summed it up like this, when we cannot do what we would, when the opportunity comes, we must do what we can. The next thing we can learn from Nehemiah is that God's guidance for you may lead you to do something opposite to what he guided someone else to do. No matter how strongly convicted that you are guided by God, never wrongly accuse the other of not being so. When Nehemiah made the trip to Jerusalem with the king's blessings, he accepted the escort of the king's officers of the army and horsemen. But this was totally opposite of what Ezra, a contemporary of Nehemiah, was guided to do when he earlier returned to Jerusalem. If you go back and you read in Ezra chapter 8, it's written there that Ezra was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect them since they had told the king that they had God to protect them. So Ezra chose to reject help from the king. Nehemiah welcomed it. Because maybe for Nehemiah, instead of discerning it as a shameful sign of doubt in God's power, he likely discerned that the escort of the king's officers was a means to verify his credibility that he was not doing anything illegal behind the king's back. And it was also a sign that God had truly granted him favour with the king for his task. Now sometimes because we feel so strongly convicted about something we sense that God has put into our heart to do and it differs from the opinion or the actions of another person, sometimes we tend to jump to the conclusion that we are guided by God, the other is not. We are definitely right, they are in the wrong. These accounts of Ezra and Nehemiah urge us to be humble about our guidance from God and that we should not be critical or suspicious of fellow Christians who think and act differently and accuse them of being unchristian and wrong. In my experience, disagreements among Christians are very often not matters of right and wrong, but merely differences in perspectives, considerations, and emphasis. And both parties really, at the end of the day, are equally committed to God's guidance. We need to learn to give one another the benefit of the doubt. After all, at the end of the day, God is our judge. I am answerable to God, the other person is also answerable to God. Who am I to judge him? And while we may be uncertain if the other is truly guided by God or not, there's one thing we can be very certain about. It is that this unity among believers and anything that leads us to be uncharitable, uncharitable to another is certainly contrary to God's will. We will see later that Nehemiah and Ezra worked in unity in the things that truly mattered, despite the different directions in this issue. So God's guidance is not a license for arrogance or discord. And the next thing is that God's guidance does not exempt obstacles, problems, or opposition. It is clear in Nehemiah 2 and in subsequent chapters that in doing what God had put into his heart to do, Nehemiah had to overcome tough opposition including external opposition, internal uncooperation, battered morale, and the threat of violence. And in the New Testament, we see the same with the Apostle Paul, who said regarding what God had put into his heart to do, he, he, he said, And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself 
if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so we should not be shocked by obstacles, problems and opposition into doubting and stopping what God has put into our hearts to do. Instead, we can rely on God to guide us and strengthen us in persevering through them and overcoming them. And the last point that we will draw from Nehemiah 2 today is that God's guidance does not negate planning and considering practical necessities. In my youth, we often had to plan various outdoor activities and we were taught that for any outdoor activity, we should always prepare a wet weather plan. But of course, we all know that means extra work for a plan that you may eventually not use at all. And so there was always a temptation to say, well, God guided us to have this activity. Let's skip the wet weather plan. Instead, let's pray with faith that it will not rain. After all, we trust that God will work for our good, isn't it? Well, yeah. But genuine faith is not about bending the hand of God to do our will. It is about us being responsible and faithful to what God has given us to do. And definitely, it should not be an excuse for oversight or laziness. Nehemiah was guided by God, and to fulfill what God had put into his heart to do, he went to survey the grounds for himself, that he may personally know the magnitude of the work and plan for what was needed for the work to be accomplished. God does not delight in laziness and irresponsibility. His guidance will not exempt it. All these things that we must learn from Nehemiah in seeking and receiving God's guidance. But before any of these things will be of any meaning and use to us, you must first answer the question, what has God put into your heart to do for the rebuilding of the broken walls of His kingdom? Fellow servants of God, what has God put into your heart to do? In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father in heaven, if we do not yet know what you have put into our hearts to do, we open our hearts to you today and ask that you speak to us and guide us. If we have a sense of what you have put into our hearts to do, but we are fearful and apprehensive for whatever reason, Lord, we ask, that you fill us with faith and courage to obey you. For those of us who are already walking in your guidance, Lord, we pray that you continue to assure us of your presence and help. Thank you, Lord, that you guide us because you want us to be a part of your great work. And so enjoy the fruits of our labor and enjoy our glory with you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.